In the vast universe of gaming, plenty of franchises have been declared imbalanced, rightfully so or not. But with all the hate that these games receive, there can only be one that sits upon the throne of salt and be crowned. In this video, we're not just exploring a game, we're exploring a phenomenon, an aberration, a creation that, intentionally or not, might never be balanced. This is the untold story of Dead by Daylight. Games like League of Legends, Dota, Counter-Strike, Fortnite, and many others have all faced balancing challenges in the past. Certain characters, items, or other mechanics can be wildly overtuned and create a horrible environment for anyone playing against it. However, the one thing all of these games have going for them is that the players are all using the same fundamental rules. Dota, for example, pits two teams against each other in a race to see who can destroy the opponent's main structure, the Ancient, First, both teams must kill other players, destroy towers, complete side objectives, and push down similar looking lanes. Even though your heroes and roles might be different, the goal and main gameplay mechanics remain the same for everyone. This is called soft asymmetry. Strong asymmetric games are like Left 4 Dead, where one side is a group of humans shooting their way through hordes of zombies to reach a safe zone, while the opposing side is a group of zombies with unique powers that are hell-bent on stopping the humans from reaching said safe zone. In Dead by Daylight, you can either assume the role of a single killer or one of the four survivors. As a killer, your goal is to kill and hook every single survivor in the game. As a survivor, your goal is to survive by completing all five generators and escaping through the exit gates or being the last survivor alive and escaping through the hatch. This asymmetry creates an interesting challenge, whereas the survivors are incentivized to avoid the killer at all costs and just do generators, the killer is instead incentivized to find as many survivors as possible to prevent them from doing generators and eventually kill them. Now, it wouldn't be very fun if survivors would die as soon as they're found. So there are various mechanics that are included with the survivor kit that allows them to interact with the killer without immediately dying. Survivors can run away from the killer using pallets and windows to make as much distance as possible between the two. If you are ever eventually caught, other survivors can unhook you, heal you, or even stun the killer to prevent you from being put on the hook in the first place. If the last half of the survivor section sounded way more entertaining than do generators, congratulations you just found the fatal flaw in Dead by Daylight's game design. As a quick reminder and recap for this section, killers win by killing three or more survivors, survivors win by surviving, survivors only win if they do generators and escape, and the most interesting and engaging part of the game for survivors is being chased by the killer. This is also usually the most engaging part of playing killer as well, using your unique power to outsmart the survivors and eventually catch them. So now, after we all understand how Dead by Daylight plays, let's look through its history of balance and see the creative ways the players have found to not play the game. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Besides being something I would see on a Modern Warfare 2 loading screen, that quote is actually Newton's third law and pretty aptly describes how early Dead by Daylight was. In 2016, when the game first released, it was without a doubt the most broken version of Dead by Daylight. In this version, survivors had access to something that we can only call infinites. These were sections of the map that were so imbalanced you could run a killer there infinitely. No matter how good a killer was, all a survivor had to do was run the route correctly and the killer would have absolutely zero chance of ever catching them. Killers who didn't know and therefore would never break off chase would often get frustrated that they could never catch the survivors, meanwhile all the generators are being done around them. And so, if you think you're never going to be able to catch that survivor again once you finally got him on the hook, are you ever going to let them go? The answer for some killers is no. In 2016, there was no penalty for camping hooks in Dead by Daylight. So more often than not, you would have a trapper place a trap right underneath the hooked player and stare directly at them for the next few minutes, waiting until they finally died. There was next to nothing any other survivor could do, so getting caught often meant getting killed. And while nice survivors avoided the infinites, and nice killers avoided face camping other survivors, if at the end of the day all you wanted to do was win, there was no penalty for using either of these mechanics. Later that year, as the game was still in quite a broken state, Behavior would release a DLC for the game which added a new killer, the Nurse. If infinites and permanently looping killers was the action, the Nurse was the reaction. She has, ever since her release, always been one of the top two killers in the entire game. And eight years later, after numerous nerfs, she's still number one. Starting, of course, with the Queen of Dead by Daylight, the Nurse. So, the Nurse has been the strongest killer in the game for a long time, and by the looks of it, it looks like she will continue to be number one for a very long time. Her killer power allows her to blink through walls, ceilings, pallets, windows, ignoring just about every mechanic in the game that would allow survivors to escape. The perfect reaction to survivors that would run the killers around for as long as they wanted. If you thought infinites and camping hooks was the worst problem at this time, think again. Hatches in Old Dead by Daylight couldn't be closed by nope. killers. There also was no endgame collapse yet, which is essentially a timer that will automatically end the game and prevent standoffs like this. So what would end up happening is the killer would find the hatch and wait for the survivor there. 
If the survivor tried to do the animation to escape through the hatch, the killer could grab them and instantly throw them over their shoulders so that they could go hook them. However, if killers hit survivors, there's a small cooldown on their attack and the survivor's hitbox is disabled, meaning the survivor could run through the killer and escape through the hatch without the killer being able to do anything. Because of this, you would have famously long standoffs, some being hours long, where both the survivor and the killer refuse to do anything else with their life except win a game of Dead by Daylight. Theoretically, there's nothing I can do at this point. I'm just wasting her time while I eat. Oh, bottles, I know. All right, guys, I'll be back in a few. Oh, forgot the plate. Guess what, bitch? I got a controller for your ass. Back in the wild, wild west of Dead by Daylight, the hatch wasn't just available to the lone survivor left. It would actually be revealed once enough generators were done. If four survivors were alive, you needed all five generators to be completed before it was revealed. If three survivors were alive, you needed four, and on and on. However, this merely revealed the hatch. Actually unlocking it required a key, an item that survivors can find around the map or bring with them at the beginning of the game, and upon interacting with the hatch, would open it. This meant the survivors didn't have to wait to open the exit gates to escape. They merely had to wait until they had enough generators that the hatch was visible on the map, use a key, and they can ensure everyone gets out safely with little to no counterplay for the killer. One might think that the obvious counter to this situation is to make sure that the survivors can't get enough generators done. I like your critical thinking, but there's a reason why this is the worst balance game ever. Along with keys, survivors could bring other items with them into the match, like medkits and toolboxes. Medkits would allow you to heal yourself and others faster, and toolboxes were obviously there for doing generators quicker. At this time, one of the add-ons for the toolbox, called Brand New Part, could be used to instantly complete a generator. There were no skill checks, there was no downside. You just click the button and the generator was done. And because every survivor could bring one if they so chose, you could have games where four generators were done in the first five seconds of a game. Or, if you were going for a hatch escape, you could bring three brand new parts and one key, complete two generators by hand, and then use the brand new parts to instantly complete the remaining three. Once the hatch was found, all you have to do was use the key and get all four survivors safely out of the game. While this might sound bad from the killer's perspective, they had their own tools that could end games quickly. Actually, I can do this. You, uh, you can see right here there's a, there's a basket and that's where he sits most of the Ebony Mori was an offering that killers could use that would allow them to kill any survivor that they downed. Without having to waste time of using the hook mechanic, you could quickly and cinematically shred your way through the survivors. And with certain killers, like the hillbilly with an insta-down mechanic, you could make the game 3v1 within 10 seconds. And unlike with hooking survivors, there was no counterplay to this, as there was no way to stop a Mori animation when it began. Because of the nature of the game and killers being able to see what survivors are holding while they're in the lobby, killers could tell whether or not someone was going to bring a key. And most killers would save all of their moris for this situation. Funnily enough, it was a lose-lose for both sides, because the old ranking system required you to get multiple points in several different categories, and if you dominated the game too hard by ending it early, you wouldn't meet the threshold for ranking up, creating an on situation where a killer could kill all four survivors and derank, or all four survivors escape and derank. But in a game like Dead by Daylight, the only real victory is making sure the other side isn't having any fun. Generators and hooks are the only ways that either side can progress the game. And while killers were never able to destroy generators, survivors had access to a perk called Saboteur that allowed them to sabotage hooks, which at the time would permanently destroy them and not allow them to be used for the remainder of the match. Because survivors could wiggle and eventually break free of the killer's grasp if they aren't hooked quickly enough, making sure the killer has nowhere to hook a survivor once they've been downed ensures that the killer can never progress the game. Thankfully, there are four hooks on the map that were never able to be destroyed, not even in this broken version of the game. Those were the basement hooks. The basement was an area that would usually spawn underneath the killer shack and the only way in or out was a single staircase. Getting hooked down there as a survivor was an instant death sentence. Most survivors at the time wouldn't even go down to help you because they knew how hopeless the situation was. Because more often than not all of your hooks would be sabotaged, most killers would run a basement build. This was a combination of two perks at the time, Agitation and Iron Grasp, which made the killer faster when they carried survivors and made it so that the wiggle percentage, which was the mechanic that allowed survivors to break free of the killer's grasp, was reduced significantly, making it borderline impossible to ever escape from a killer. This pairing of perks allowed the killer to take you from wherever you were downed on the map all the way into the basement. And once you were there, 
you were not likely to get out. As the other two perks that a killer would run, Unrelenting and Save the Best for Last, would reduce the cooldown on their attacks so much that even if another survivor managed to get you off that hook, the killer could down both of you before you even reached the base of the stairs. Eventually, Dead by Daylight would release Leatherface, one of the strongest insta-down killers, so notorious for his defense of the basement that they would be Hello? known as Basement Bubbas. But that's a discussion for a different time. The first licensed DLC for Dead by Daylight, the Halloween chapter, which brought Michael Myers and Laurie Strode, paved the way for future licensed DLCs, and as to be expected, broke the game even further. Haddonfield, the DLC added map, was so horribly imbalanced that most killers would DC at the site. There was even a house titled the House of Pain for how hard it was for killers to catch survivors there. One of the main issues at the time was that Haddonfield was full of windows and full of drop downs. For those who don't know, killers move slowly through windows while survivors move faster. And while technically, if a survivor falls from a great height, they're supposed to be staggered for a couple seconds, slowing them and allowing the killer to catch up, there was a perk in the game called Balance Landing, which reduced the stagger effect from falls by up to 75%. And after landing, you would sprint at 150% of your normal running speed, with a cooldown of only 40 seconds. And at the time, this wasn't an exhaustion perk, so you could use other things like Sprint Burst with this. If this sounds pretty horrible, it was. However, this might be the most balanced thing out of the entire DLC. Because with this DLC, not only do we have Decisive Strike, but we have Object of Obsession. This perk, probably most out of everything I've mentioned so far, has left a scar on the community, and is one of the reasons why people hate Survive With Friends with so much passion. Object of Obsession was a perk that made you the obsession of the killer. Looking at them outside of their terror radius, revealed your aura to each other, which essentially just meant you could see each other through walls. In a vacuum, this sounds like not the greatest perk. The killer can see you wherever you go, making it almost impossible to escape from them? Why would you want that? Well, with a little tool we call Discord, and something most people haven't heard of, friends, you could not only track everything that the killer was doing, but relay every single movement. This made killers like Wraith, whose only power was going invisible, utterly useless, and killers like Trapper, I that relied can. on strategically placing traps across the map that hopefully survivors would stand on, also useless. While this perk was released in 2016, it wouldn't get nerfed until 2021, making stealth killers released during this time, like Ghostface, almost unplayable. Other notable additions, like Decisive Strike, which unlike how the perk is used now, as an anti-tunnel measure, used to allow you to stun the killer as soon as you were picked up for the first time. And because every single survivor could run it, it created what we now call the slug meta, where killers, knowing that everyone had Decisive Strike, would refuse to pick up survivors and just let them bleed out on the ground for four minutes. What an exciting time for Dead by Daylight that was. Killers also got their fair share of goodies. This was also the introduction of Save the Best for Last, Play with Your Food, and Dying Light. All perks that would end up becoming staples of a lot of good killer builds until they were inevitably nerfed. And Michael, the newest killer to the Dead by Daylight killer roster, came with an add-on combo that was potentially stronger than even Mori's. His iridescent add-on, Judith's Tombstone, allowed you to insta-kill every single survivor that you caught, even if they were at full health, and by comboing that with another add-on, you could have permanent tier 3 on Michael Myers, meaning that for the rest of the game, as long as you could get to tier 3 once, you would be able to insta-kill every survivor. Although, you would have to find the survivor first. Moonlight Offerings and Fog Offerings were offerings that could change the way that the game looked. Certain Moonlight Offerings would allow you to dim the light of the map, and Fog Offerings would allow you to increase the amount of fog on the map. Comboed together, you could have a map that is so dark that most killers can't see you, God even if you're walking it, around right in front of them. Again. This was made worse by Iron Will, which, when injured, would prevent you from making any noises, and the infamous P3 Claudette, which in layman terms was Prestige 3 Claudette, a character with a bloody cosmetic that allowed them to blend in with the environment, which rendered them borderline invisible. Funnily enough, Claudettes were hated on just about every side of the aisle, because every survivor that played with another Claudette would notice them crouching in the corner of the map. Claudette doing? I don't know, probably hiding in a bush. Claudette, can you do a fucking gen? I don't know what to do. I've been literally getting chased for 20 minutes. Can she run? You really shouldn't count this as Look at her! Run! Just came back after a shower and how long has this game lasted? So sorry, Noob3. You did not deserve this at all. Don't count. Claudette was watching your stream. And every killer was trying to figure out how to adjust their brightness to 400% so that they could actually see the goddamn game. I'm sure we were close to getting the Seeing Eye Dog DLC, but Behavior wasn't able to secure the license for Air Bud. So far, I haven't talked too much about Survive With Friends, even though they're a core reason of why Dead by Daylight is one of the most imbalanced games ever. 
Survive with friends isn't anything complicated, all it is is playing Survivor with your friends. In most games, this isn't really a problem. However, Dead by Daylight was obviously not made to give so much information to survivors. Not only is there no voice chat when you get into the game, there's no text chat, and the only form of communication that you can have with your other survivors in the game is by teabagging, pointing at them, or waving at them to come. Without perks, you shouldn't even be able to tell the location of other survivors in the game, and back then there was no way for you to know whether or not someone else was doing a generator, getting chased by a killer, or hiding in a locker for 60 seconds. Look at this dumbass killer, bro. You ain't gonna find me, bro. You ain't finding me. I'm the stealth fucking god. Ah! Yet, if you played with your friends in Discord, all of this information and more was available to you. As I already went over, Object of Obsession made the game even worse and pretty much showcased that anytime you would run Survive with Friends, you would have a massive advantage over anyone who didn't. It was kind of like playing Among Us, but you didn't mute at the beginning. Let's go. Felix, you're not muted. Killing time. Oh. In general, there was really nothing wrong with Survive with Friends. Again, it was just you playing with your friends. The real problematic part was bully squads. These were people that usually had no lives, would queue up with their friends, and instead of actually playing the game, would make sure that the killer had the worst time possible. All of the imbalanced things I've talked about previously, infinite, brand new parts, keys, sabotaging hooks, bringing map offerings so you would always go to the same map, bringing moonlight offerings so you would always not be able to see shit, bringing flashlights so you could never pick up a survivor without being blinded, all in the name to piss off the killer and hopefully get them to disconnect. Killers like the nurse and the hillbilly at the time were strong enough that in the hands of a good player could still beat these bully stacks. However, trying to play Trapper or the Wraith against someone running Object of Obsession and bringing multiple flashlights so you can never pick up a survivor without being stunned made the game awful to play for anyone who wasn't willing to play the most meta killer with the most meta perks or for anyone new at the game. Flashlights were the items of choice for survivors during this time because they could do something called Instant Blind, where you'd point a flashlight at a killer and it would blind them before they could even look away. It was bad enough that even during mid-chase, you could be blinded by the survivor you're running after. This spawned numerous memes, including some where the trapper was in a corner being constantly clicked and flashlighted at by a group of four survivors. But you know what they say about those who fly too close to the sun. During a Korean Twitch event in 2017, Matthew Coat, the game director for Dead by Daylight, had the opportunity to talk about Dead by Daylight with a panel of other hosts. One of the panelists mentioned that as survivors get better at the game, the game becomes more survivor-sided. Here's what Matthew says. Yeah, so at the, when you're at the low levels, killers have a bit of an advantage, and when you get to the high levels, the survivors have a bit of an advantage, but it's a very, very small margin, uh, and something that we're, we're looking at and constantly trying to calibrate, and it's gonna, it's gonna change with the way uh, we're, uh, we're rating the performance. Uh, that, that's something that's coming very soon. Later, Matthew was even challenged by one of the hosts on the panel, saying that the game would be more balanced if he was a better player, and eventually coaxing him into playing killer in front of everybody. There, there. Uh, they're talking about like you know how good of a player that you you would be or how bad you would be at, yeah. yeah and you know since you're the developer and you know he was saying oh you're it looks like you'll be pretty good since you're the developer but him looks um was saying that if you were a very skillful high tier player the balance would be a little better that's what he said <laughs> If you don't mind, uh, would you like uh, playing uh, you know, a, a game as a killer right now? Uh, sure, I okay. can do that. Keep in mind that this game was a public match. This was just a random group of survivors they found when they queued up in Korea. And this was one of the most one-sided ass beatings I've ever seen. The game director of Dead by Daylight was getting teabagged at every pallet, flashlighted mid-chase, insta-blinded every time they would go to hit a pallet, only had two hits on survivors the entire game, one of which was completely countered by adrenaline. And at the end of the game, in the post-game chat of a game that only lasted five minutes, the survivors typed, Noob Killer. Asian level play of Dead by Daylight. Noob Killer. Sealing the flashlight's fate forever. Now you you felt how, you know, the killers feel when, you know, a team of three, a team of four, yeah, I, I, go up against you with flashlights and they just play around with you, so... I, 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 I that already. You know, why not upgrade the killers a little bit if you felt what, you know, the pain was as being alone in the woods as a killer by yourself. The, the, the flashlights are extremely powerful and it's very frustrating when you get an organized group playing against you like this uh, and th these are tweaks that are going to happen. But uh, yeah, definitely we want to make sure that both sides are always having fun, but some combinations are going to be much more powerful. Roughly one month later, flashlights were nerfed and the insta line mechanic no longer existed. That game was like putting Oppenheimer in the fresh fallout of a nuclear bomb. Karmic retribution at its finest. I really do think we could solve all balance issues by forcing every Dead by Daylight dev 
to have to play against Survive with Friend Stacks every single day. Now, the flashlight nerf wasn't the end. Even today, using a flashlight as a survivor feels like you're chasing the killer instead of the other way around. But at least now, insta blinds are no longer. Over time, admittedly, Dead by Daylight got more and more balanced. Sadly, balance didn't really mean more fun. Gen rushing, while not as strong as it used to be in the era of the old brand new parts where you could simply click a button and instantly complete a generator, was becoming more and more of an issue as the average skill of the player base was increasing. Not only were survivors able to hit better skill checks, but they were also getting more confident in dealing with the killer. Anyone who's played Dead by Daylight enough might know this feeling. Being utterly frightened at the beginning, hiding in corners, hiding in tall grass, and trying your best to avoid the killer while you get the gens done, before finally growing some balls after enough hours, and being confident enough to stick on a generator even if you hear that heartbeat. This not only meant the killers would have to deal with survivors that could loot them more easily, but they also had to apply more pressure than they ever have. And back in the day, there wasn't really much of an answer other than Noed and Ruin. Noed, also called No One Escapes Death, is the original second chance perk. Once the exit gates were opened, Killers with this perk would increase their movement speed by 5% and have their missed attack cooldown decreased by 8%, which could stack with other perks that do the same thing. Not only that, but every hit on a survivor would instantly down them. In its original incarnation, this was simply a perk and had absolutely no cooldown. It was the ultimate new killer perk and frustrated the hell out of survivors. While this perk was meant to give killers like Trapper and Wraith, weaker killers that can be abused, a way back into the game to score a couple kills, there was nothing preventing nurses from running this perk as well. The only counterplay to a nurse with no ed was literally walking out of the map Surprise, as soon as you saw it. You could be the best survivor in the world, but there's no way you're dodging a nurse with seven blinks and a one hit down. Later, as time went on, it would get nerfed to only last for 120 seconds, two minutes, after the exit gates have been opened. A good change, but still, two minutes is plenty of time for a killer to take care of any stray, straggle, straggle, blah, stragglers. When the hag was introduced and we finally got our first taste of hexes, perks that were tied to totems that would randomly spawn on the map and once cleansed would remove the effect for the remainder of the game. This allowed for some counterplay to Noed. Because if survivors did the optional side objective of cleansing all the totems on the map, Noed would never activate, potentially solving two problems at once, one being the killer's complaint that gens were being done too quickly, and two, survivors' complaints that Noed is too easy, an interesting and welcome way to balance parts of the game. However, as I said in the beginning, balance isn't always fun. There was another perk that was very popular at the time, almost every killer would run it, it was called Hex Ruin. I assume it was short for Hex Ruin the Game, because that's certainly what this perk did at the time. This, along with some other perks, was one of the reasons that I could no longer get my friends to get into Dead by Daylight. How Hex Ruin worked was, every time a survivor would hit a good skill check, meaning just a regular skill check that provided no bonus, they would instead regress the generator by 5%. Great skill checks, which are hard to hit for new players, would grant 0% bonus progression on the generator. In other words, if you weren't hitting an incredibly hard quick time event, you would actually reverse the progress on a generator. And if there were multiple survivors on a generator all missing the skill checks, you wouldn't be able to make any progress. And killers weren't nice about this either. They would run perk combos like Huntress's Lullaby that would remove the audio warning for a skill check coming up, or killers would play someone like the Doctor, which could make your skill check spawn at random spots on your screen. The counter to Ruin was finding it and cleansing it, therefore rendering it inactive and making the killer play with only three perks for the remainder of the game. There were a few problems with this during the time. For one, totems would spawn in a completely random spot on the map, and sometimes could even spawn directly in front of a survivor. Another problem was, certain killers like the Trapper and the Hag could place traps where their Ruin is and defend it the entire game. Thirdly, if you're a new survivor, you're going to have no idea what's happening and why the generator just won't make any progress. It was also even more frustrating for experienced players who knew what was happening and would have a new player come to their generator, miss a skill check, and get rid of all of the progress they just made on this generator. I'll never forget when my friend asked whether Ruin was a built-in mechanic because every single killer that we played against, even at the lowest rank possible, was running Ruin. It was extremely weak at the higher levels, as unless you were someone like the Hag that could defend all of your hexes, most coordinated survivors could figure out that Ruin is in the game and go find it and cleanse it, therefore rendering it useless against any high tier survivor, but making it absolutely horrible for new players. Somewhere around the time where Ruin was at its most aids, 
The survivor's perks were beginning to become quite predictable as well. There was a certain build that every survivor would run that would take care of just about every single need they had. Adrenaline, dead hard, borrowed time, decisive strike, and unbreakable were almost all but guaranteed to be on just about every survivor. Decisive strike and unbreakable were usually used interchangeably, as the killer had no way of knowing which one you had. On one hand, if they pick you up and you have decisive strike, they get stunned. On the other hand, if you have unbreakable and they leave you there, you just get back up. Killers really had no way of knowing, so the mind game was kind of enough. Once you began to face against experienced players in Dead by Daylight, all of the builds started to look the same. Most survivors would know what most killers were running, and most killers would know what most survivors were running. In a way, it was kind of like mutually assured destruction, where if one side decided to not bring a meta perk, they would get bullied for the rest of the game. Better to bring Mori's and Noed than getting teabag and flashlight spammed by a bunch of survivors running adrenaline and dead hard. And once again, killer balance was rearing its ugly head. We were approaching what some would call the worst time in Dead by Daylight history. The first killer, the Spirit, quickly became one of the best killers in the game, almost usurping Nurse. Her entire kit was built around fucking with survivors' heads and causing issues for even the most experienced survivors. She had a phasing mechanic, which would intermittently cause her to disappear for barely a second, but long enough to mind game survivors. This was completely passive and had nothing to do with how good the spirit was, and it would often gift you hits on survivors. Her vault animation that allowed her to go through windows, also, didn't play an animation at all. Instead of playing an actual animation, she would just teleport through it after about a second. Survivors had no way of knowing whether or not she was just mind gaming. Her main ability allowed her to leave a husk behind and travel through the ethereal plane. What this meant was she had a highly increased movement speed, she could no longer see survivors but she could still hear them and see their scratch marks, and once she releases the power button she could teleport to wherever she phase walked to. If a survivor was watching her phase walk, all they would see is the husk left behind, which only looks like the spirit is standing still. She was a character perfect for the time, and came with an add-on that silenced her phase walk cue, meaning survivors had no way of knowing whether or not she was phase walking allowing her to grab them off of generators and instantly hook them. She was, and still is, one of the more oppressive killers in Dead by Daylight. However, her reign of terror was short-lived, as only a few months later, Dead by Daylight would release probably the worst DLC they've ever made, Darkness Among Us. Sus. The Darkness Among Us DLC added Legion, a new killer, and Ormond, a new map. On release, Legion was the most broken killer in all of the game. Can't wait. Legion on release. Oh, I'm so salty arguably. about this. Now, arguably awesome. the worst time in DVD history, right? Like, really? I mean, it's it's got to be discussed as like the worst period of time oh, in the game's wow. meta. And Ormon was the absolute worst map to play if you were killer, and survivors would send you here every game. In the trailer for the DLC, it appeared that this would be some kind of deceptive killer in Among Us before Among Us. When the Legion released, and it turned out that it was actually just a regular M1 killer, and your main power was being really fast and smacking the shit out of survivors, everyone was a little bit more than disappointed. Essentially how this killer would play was, you'd activate your power to get a speed boost, allow you to jump through windows and vault over pallets faster, and every time you would hit a survivor, you would inflict deep wounds on them, extend the amount of time that you could stay in your power, and have every other survivor on the map revealed to you. It was a hit and run style gameplay, where you could quickly injure all four survivors on the map, but your power had no inherent way of downing survivors by itself. Now, the deep wound mechanic is basically a timer where if survivors don't mend themselves, they will automatically go down. The timer is paused when you're in a chase with a killer, that way, a killer can't just chase you and wait for the timer to run out. Players quickly found out that all you had to do was inflict deep wound and look at the ground, and it would count as ending the chase. So Legion players would hit you with Deep Wound, and then look at the ground like the shy little guys they are, following you everywhere you go and waiting for you to inevitably drop from the Deep Wound. Let's just go break this, so I can get out of the, uh, the chase, follow the blood marks. Hi. <laughs> That's the most toxic thing you can ever do on Legion. Just down them. They can't do anything because they're not, they're not in a chase, so they can't keep running. Bullshit. There were also other fun combos to run with the Legion, like Stab Wound Study and Frank's Mixtape, that allowed you to ignore the main mechanic of Legion, which is hit one survivor, go for the next survivor, and quickly injure all of the survivors on the map. And instead, you would just chase one survivor, hit them again, and their deep wound timer would go down to zero. And then we got Frank's mixtape, basically making it so that I only have to hit them three times with my ability in order to down them. Go ahead and double hit him too.
This obviously felt horrible if you were a survivor player because there wasn't really much you could do. The Legion was built around being able to vault windows quickly, vault pallets quickly, and basically always have a guaranteed hit on you. Not only was this exceptionally boring for survivors. Yeah. I, uh, I have a funny story too. I'm not going to name names here, but prominent DVD survivor main, uh, literally banned me from their channel for a period of time because I ran, I ran Frank's mixtape against them. And it turns out that he just went on a thing where he banned everybody that used Frank's mixtape. Whatever survivor you chose to bully that game would be having zero fun. Behavior quickly remedied this by nerfing the Legion, removing any way for him to get quick downs. And once every survivor was injured, you had to play him like a regular M1 killer without any power. Since then, Legion's always been quite a weak killer and most survivors that play against him don't really have to heal up ever, as there really is no downside to being injured against the Legion and some perks even get stronger when you're injured. Which, speaking of healing, healing in Dead by Daylight has almost never been balanced. A prime example of this is the syringe add-on for the medkit. Nowadays, when you use the syringe, you'll heal after 16 seconds. You might have heard other people call this an instant heal, which is a side effect from back in the day when this item did in fact instantly heal you. So during a chase, all you'd have to do is drop a pallet and then instantly heal with a medkit, something that would usually take 16 seconds that you could immediately apply and doing so during chase. Now that's pretty strong. However, that's probably the most balanced thing out of everything I'm going to list here. In classic Dead by Daylight fashion, they released a DLC called The Hour of the Witch bringing a new survivor, Michaela Reed, and introducing boons, which are essentially just hex totems for survivors. Although there's never really a downside to having a boon, as I'm even though boon. killers can snuff them out, the survivor that has the boon can just keep reapplying them, boon. as long as there are totems left to use. So ironically, the only people that can really get rid of boon totems forever are the survivors themselves. Now, Michaela's boon totem is Circle of Healing. On release and for a while after, this boon was one of the most popular perks to run as a survivor. As any survivor within a 24 meter radius of this boon, which every survivor survivor could see the aura of, gave you a 100% bonus to healing speeds and self-care. Self-care is a Claudette ability that allows you to heal yourself without another survivor doing it for you. The downside being that you would do it at a reduced speed. In other words, if just one person brought Boon Circle of Healing and placed the Boon on the map, that gave every survivor in the game an extra perk, on top of the fact that you're already going to be healing quicker. Keep in mind that if a killer brought Ruin into the game and a survivor cleansed that totem, that perk is now disabled for the rest of the game. It took behavior over a year to nerf this perk and stands as one of the most annoying heal metas in Dead by Daylight history. I wish I could say that that was the most broken time for healing, but there is in fact one other time that puts even this one to shame. The God Mode Healing Era. Back in the day, healing used to be a lot faster in Dead by Daylight. Not only that, but you could bring medkits and a perk like Botany Knowledge to increase your heal speeds even further. Survivors back in the day could self-care themselves faster then than they can heal others now. But with the perk Will Make It, not only could they heal themselves at blazingly fast speeds, they could heal themselves quicker than a killer could swing, giving survivors God Mode for as long as the perk was active, which at the time was up to two minutes. This meant that you could essentially block a hook forever, and with some smart teamwork, you might be able to trap a killer in the corner. In classic Dead by Daylight fashion, the hillbilly, the strongest killer at the time, did have some counterplay to this because Stop they could it. instant down survivors. But for people who played Trapper and Wraith, the two weaker killers, there was absolutely no counterplay. The most hysterical thing about it was all it took was all three healing perks at the time, and you could have God Mode. But that was all in the past. Surely, self-care will never be broken to the point where it could be abused against other killers as well, right? Freddy Krueger, another horror icon, has had an interesting balance history in Dead by Daylight, going from the weakest killer in Dead by Daylight history. Alright man, you had your moment in the spotlight, I cannot make you sound good. <laughs> Freddy is just that kid in school everyone bullied. Anyways, that was my tier list. To one of the strongest. Next up, we're gonna go for Freddy. Now, some people will question the fact that Freddy is this low. To one of the weakest again. The worst killer in the game, arguably, right now, is Freddy. <laughs> I'll let Matthew, my goat, explain what Freddy's original power was. Freddy's power is called Dream Demon. Freddy is invisible to non-sleepers, although he can be heard by paying close attention to the lullaby. When close enough to a normal survivor, Freddy can activate his power to tag him with sleepiness. Once a survivor is tagged with sleepiness, the killer suffers from a minor speed penalty and the survivor is gradually gonna fall asleep. During that time, the survivor's aura is no longer shown to Freddy. This is his chance of hiding or trying to wake up. After a short delay, the survivor falls asleep. He's now in the dream world. He can now see the killer and be hurt by him. In short, 
Any survivors that weren't already asleep could not see or hear Freddy. Freddy, on the other hand, could not interact with a survivor that was awake. Freddy's only power at this time was putting survivors to sleep. And to achieve this, Freddy had to target survivors and wait seven seconds before they would be put asleep. Once they were finally asleep, Freddy could hit them, see their aura once they're out of his terror radius, and all survivors had a 50% action speed penalty, which meant that healing, repairing, sabotaging, cleansing totems, all of that was reduced by 50%. Survivors could do three things to wake themselves up. Find another survivor to wake them up, get hooked, or fail a skill check. That last part is the reason that Freddy was the worst killer in the game. During this time, survivors who knew how Freddy's killer power worked would run self-care and intentionally miss the skill checks to be knocked out of the dream world. Once they did that, Freddy could no longer do anything to them. Awake survivors were completely immune to anything that Freddy would do. They could unhook in front of him, vault in front of him, do anything they wanted. As long as they weren't in the dream world, he was absolutely powerless. But did Freddy receive a rework? Did he receive a buff that would allow him to counterplay survivors? No, in the first patch after his release, Freddy only received nerfs. The reason for this being, Freddy was an absolute menace to anyone who did not know how his power worked. Not only could he see you from across the map, but all of your action speeds were 50% slower, meaning that new players who already had a problem doing generators were getting absolutely obliterated by Freddy players. And so, Freddy remained in this limbo for another two years before he would finally get a rework rejuvenating him and making him one of the strongest killers in Dead by Daylight. He functions almost exactly the same as he does now, but previously he had a lot of add-ons that would slow down the game, and paired with other perks, gave him the moniker Forever Freddy, due to how long Freddy games could really get. However, there's been multiple nerfs since then, and now Sharpan Joe isn't quite what he used to be. It has come to my attention that you haven't subscribed yet, and as a result, we've decided to nerf Pig. The Pig is one of the funniest sagas in all of Dead by Daylight history. Nowadays, she lives in the infamous meme, Nerf Pig, but there's an explanation of why it seems that Dead by Daylight can't stop nerfing the pig. Much like it is nowadays, in 2018, when the pig first released, killers were complaining about how fast gens would progress, often losing one or two in the first chase. So to mitigate this, Behavior did what they would always do, and release a DLC that would address these problems. One of the pig's main mechanics was putting reverse bear traps on survivors' heads. Once down, the pig could put a reverse bear trap on a survivor's head, and the next time a generator was completed, that trap would activate. The survivors would then have to go and search through several jigsaw boxes scattered across the map, and hopefully remove the reverse bear trap from their heads. If they failed to or tried to exit through the gates, the reverse bear trap would activate and kill them. At the time, she was the only killer with built-in slowdown, and because of the RNG nature of jigsaw boxes, sometimes being able to remove the reverse bear trap after the first jigsaw box, and sometimes having to go through five, she was an absolute menace to new survivors. And initially, upon release, she could block the final jigsaw box so that nobody could get the key, and therefore they'd die. All of this makes it sound like the pig was actually a very strong killer, and technically, she was. Much like Freddy, the pig has always been very good at killing newer survivors, skewing her kill rate, the statistics the devs use to balance the game, much, much higher than it really should be, which has, over the years, led to non-stop nerfs. First, they increased her terror radius, which is quite debilitating for a stealth killer. Later that year, they nerfed her reverse bear traps so that they no longer activated when the endgame collapse began, and therefore made the pig bad enough that gen rushing, the thing that she was designed to stop, actually countered her. If you couldn't down all four survivors and put a trap on their head before they completed all five generators, half your power would be disabled until the game ends. But that's not all. Once again, later that year, they would nerf the other part of the pig's power, her ambush attack, and make it no longer count as a basic attack. This meant things like save the best for last, sloppy butcher, and exposure attacks. Since these many, many nerfs, the pig received add-on reworks, which were essentially nerfs to many of her popular add-ons, and some changes to the general RNG of the jigsaw boxes. Most of these changes came as a surprise to the community, as she never really was a top killer. Both her and Freddy are perfect examples of why this game will never be balanced. No matter how bad a killer actually might be, if their average kill rate is a little bit too high, nerf them until all you see is blight and nurses. Today, Den by Daylight might be at its most balanced point it's ever been, but it's still filled with some of the absolute most ridiculous shit you've ever seen. Background player being one of the number one offenders right now. I could have talked about a couple other things. For example, the old made for this and hope combo, which would make survivors just as fast as Huntress, or Medal of Man, where every fourth hit you took would be completely free. So in summary, Dead by Daylight is the worst balance game of all time and will continue to be. The developers will keep adding more perks, more killers, each more unbalanced than the last, and each one being a paid DLC. The classic League of Legends strategy of making broken champions and collecting fat paychecks when people want to play them. Make sure to like the video. And if you're asking why I play this game, 
let me say this. Some people like cock and ball torture, and I like playing Dead by Daylight from time to time. While one makes it nearly impossible to procreate, and the other is cock and ball torture, I'd like to remind you, the viewer, not to kink shame. Swag Money 69 signing out. Well, wouldn't you know it, as I'm making this video, Behavior went and did a Behavior thing and did a incredibly busted rework for the twins. The way the twins used to work was you had two parts of the killer, Charlotte and Victor. Charlotte functions just like a normal M1 killer, but her power allowed her to control Victor, a tiny little gremlin that will hop right off her body and could chase survivors very quickly. If you were healthy, Victor would latch onto you and make you injured, forcing the killer to have to control Charlotte again. And you couldn't use Victor unless you downed the survivor or that survivor punted the little shit. If a survivor was injured, Victor would down them. You'd still have control over Victor, so you could slug multiple injured survivors at once. She was somewhat like the opposite of Legion, where you always wanted to be fully healed and you'd pair up so you could kick Victor. Now, there's somewhat of an opposite effect. In the PTB, if he hits a healthy survivor, he gets a small cooldown on his attack, but then he can do it again, downing the survivor and giving control back to Charlotte. There is absolutely zero counterplay. I saw a clip of Ots, a popular Dead by Daylight content creator, hit a survivor three times in the span of around 10 seconds, with the survivor having absolutely no way of avoiding it. A lot of people are calling this like old Legion. That's the state of Twins right now. Am I right about yes, that? Yes, absolutely. At this point, what I might do is, um, you can get custom icon packs. Yeah, um, I might get custom icon packs that replaces Twins either with a picture of the Legion or, or with just a silhouette. And are calling this the worst change that has ever been made. This cannot go live. This is one of the worst things you've ever designed in the game's history. It is vir a virtually zero counterplay and extremely strong. Uh, way too strong. Right now it's just in the PTB, but keep in mind the old Legion made it out of the PTB as well. Uh, another question, playing killers uh, was fun a long time ago, but now it's only stressful. Well, that's an opinion, a valid opinion, but that's an opinion. I used to love playing as a killer, win or lose, it was fun, but currently no matter what, it's just filled with stress and anger. Killers aren't feared anymore. Uh, do you have any plans or ideas how you would like to improve the killer experience? Well, I, I would say maybe try Survivor for a bit. Uh, no, but it's true. I mean, change it up. Maybe you're just tired, you know, or play something else for a, a week. Try civilization or something. Just for a refreshing change. Uh, balance is... Uh, um, I shouldn't be saying that. Should I be saying that? It's a good game. Just play that. No, Bjorn is telling me I shouldn't be saying that. Okay. Uh,